Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Bless the Lord who caused all the holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. A reading from the book of Isaiah. I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it or the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days or an old person who does not live out a lifetime. For one who dies at a hundred years will be considered a youth and one who falls short of a hundred will be considered accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build another inhab uh, day, who? They shall not build and shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity for they shall be offspring blessed by the Lord, 
and their descendants as well. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. But the serpent, its food shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. A reading from the second letter of Paul to the Thessalonians. Now we command you, beloved, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from believers who are living in idleness and not according to the tradition that they received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us. We were not idle when we were with you, and we did not eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we work day and night so that we might not burden any of you. This was because we do not have that right, but in order to give you an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this command. Anyone unwilling to work should not eat. For we hear that some of you are living in idleness, mere busybodies, not doing any work. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Brothers and sisters, do not be weary in doing what is right. The word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, Jesus said, As for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. They asked him, Teacher, when will this be? And what will be the signs that this is about to take place? And he said, Beware that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name and say, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified, for these things take place first, but the end will not follow immediately. Then he said to them, Nations will rise against nation and kingdoms against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes in various places, famine and plagues. And there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to the synagogues and prisons. And you will be brought before kings and governors in my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not one hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. One of the places that we visited on our recent pilgrimage to the Holy Land was a pretty small church perched on top of Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel is actually more like a ridge. It's 2,700 feet above sea level. It's not like mountains that you would find in the Appalachians or the Rockies. But the terrace on top affords you a panoramic view of the plains at the base of the ridge. And it was at this spot that the prophet Elijah slew 450 priests in one afternoon. I think it's pretty good when I get the lawn cut. We were standing on the, this plaza, taking in the beautiful scenery, and our guide shifted our attention to a small hill that was protruding up from the valley floor, maybe three or four miles away. And he said to us, do you see that hill? I'm like, yeah. It's called Megiddo, or in English, Armageddon. That, my friends, he said, is where the war to mark the end of the world will be fought. That was quite a sobering thought. Because two days later, we were standing at the temple wall, the temple mount in Jerusalem, and at the south end of the temple, archaeologists uncovered these stairs. They're about 100 feet wide, and they rise up like a stadium. Now, unlike steps that we're used to, where the rise and the run are of equal height and equal depth, so we don't trip over things, theirs was designed on purpose to be uneven. The rises and the runs were all different heights and different widths. And they were designed that way because they wanted you to trip and fall if you were running up the steps, literally. You have to climb those steps deliberately 
and carefully and slowly because the Jewish people of Jesus' time believed that God resided in the temple. And as one approached the temple, you did so slowly and with a sense of awe. And so you didn't trip. These stairs were the public access to the temple. And as we stood on those stairs, you couldn't help but being struck by this sense of sacred historicity. These were the same steps. These were the very same steps that Jesus and his disciples climbed when they went to the temple. These are the very same steps that Jesus climbed before he talked to the disciples in the reading for this morning. Because the only way to get to the plaza was up those same steps. And they climbed these steps together before he sat down and told them about the impending destruction of the temple. As for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All of them will be thrown down. Standing, literally looking out over Armageddon, standing, looking at the ruins of the destroyed temple, put the fragility of our human existence into crystal clarity. Just prior to visiting the southern steps of the temple, we were in line to actually visit the top of the Temple Mount. And you've probably seen this in pictures, the great Dome of the Rock, the great golden dome sitting on top of the plaza and, the, and another mosque at the other end of it. Um, and in Israel, security is tight all over the place. And it's even more so as you approach the Temple Mount. And we had gone through the metal detectors and we were waiting to pass through the stone archway onto the actual plaza of the Temple Mount which is the only way in allowed to non-Muslims. When all of a sudden policemen with submachine guns and body armor descended upon us and they were yelling in Hebrew and Arabic and English to get out, to get away, and that the temple was closed and we had to leave. No explanation. No sense of what was going on. But our guide, who was very stoic, really good guide, smart guy, very stoic, you could see the sense of panic on his face as he rushed to push us back through security and get back out onto the street. And as it turns out, only minutes before we were ready to pass through that gate, Israeli police had shot and killed a wife, a, life, a knife-wielding Islamic jihadist who was trying to gain access to the plaza at the same time we were. The reality of the tensions in the Middle East, in Israel, and Jerusalem manifested themselves right there before our eyes. And that vision of looking down on Armageddon came flooding back in my mind, as did Jesus' words this morning. When you hear of wars and insurrections, don't be terrified, for these things must take place first. But the end will not follow immediately. There have been predictions of the end times since the beginning of time. There's this whole genre of end times fiction and popped up especially in the 80s and 90s and perhaps you've read some of them. The most prominent was like the Left Behind series by Tim LaHaye. People have tried to twist around the book of Daniel and the book of Revelations to point out when the I'm time will come and try to pinpoint that time with accuracy. When we hear Jesus saying nation will rise against nation and kingdoms against kingdoms, we think that maybe... We might be living in the end times, right? When we watch the news, when we look at the internet, it would be easy to fall into the trap of thinking that the end times are near. Jesus talking about nations rising up against the nations were true in his time. It was true before his time. It's true in our time. And it will be true a long time after we're all dead and gone. And anybody who says that they can predict when the end of time will be here is full of hooey. Jesus reminds us in Matthew 24 about the day, the hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor even me, but only the Father. Only the Father knows when the end time will be. So what does this all mean? What does this mean in, the, in, these readings, in this reading for today when we talk about the end of the world? And it's just this. 
It has nothing to do with the end of the world. It has everything to do with how we live in the here and the now. And so how do we live in the present when we don't know what the future looks like? We live in the present when we don't know what the future looks like because we partner with God, giving all that we have because God has work for us to do. That was the lessons in St. Paul's letter to the Thessalonians today. St. Paul's view was shifting over the course of his life. When he first started after the, on the road to Tarsus and in the first part of his ministry, he fully expected to see Jesus come back. He fully expected to see the second coming of Christ. But by the time he wrote this letter, he had started to come to the idea that maybe it wasn't going to happen quite as fast as he thought it was. And oh, by the way, those of you in Thessalonica who are waiting to see Jesus too, get a job. Because you're not going to see it. Keep praying, support each other, but get a day job. Jesus was a radical. Jesus was a revolutionary. Jesus started to try a revolution in which the last are first, in which the proud get scattered, and the lowly are lifted up. God fills the hungry with good things in that revolution and sends the rich away empty. Jesus tried to start a revolution in which the sick were healed and the poor were blessed and that we're all beloved children of God equally, regardless of our race or our creed or our orientation or any other way that we as human beings like to slice up our own humanity and divvy it out according to our beliefs. Jesus tried to start a revolution and that revolution continues to this day and it depends in part upon us to keep it going. So the question for today is, are you in on the revolution or not? Jesus told his disciples, all will be thrown down and not one stone will be left upon another. And that actually came to pass 30 years after his death. The Roman army would plunder Jerusalem in the year 70 and soldiers would pillage the temple and tear it down and murder women and children and destroy everything that the people of Israel held dear. But death and destruction never get the last word. Jesus died a brutal death at the hand of the military state, not because of some radical theological belief, but because of radical social beliefs. Jesus empowered the lowly. Jesus wanted to empower the poor and the sick and the outcasts and the marginalized. Jesus wanted to usher in a new kingdom called the kingdom of God. And for that, he was killed. On that Good Friday, the Romans thought, oh, we've killed him, that shows him, we're in charge. On that Good Friday, the temple police thought the same thing. Oh good, that itinerant preacher, he's gone, he's out of the way, we don't have to worry about him. How often do we live our Good Friday and think, hmm, I think I'm pretty smart. I don't think I need to listen to what God has to say because I think I'm smart enough to figure it out for myself. We all have Fridays like that. But then along comes Sunday. Along comes Sunday and the stone is rolled back and on Sunday the resurrection explodes out of that empty tomb. And on Sunday God reminds us that God is still in charge. Now through all of this kingdom business, Jesus does not promise us that it is going to be easy. In fact, he tells us just the opposite. He didn't promise that life would be no distress or illness or pain. Jesus does promise that God is with us through everything to the end of the age and that God is in charge and we can trust in God when we can't trust in anything else. What do we do today when we don't know tomorrow? Well, we try to figure out what God is up to in the world, and then we seek and humbly ask God to let us get on board with the revolution and be part of that movement and usher in the kingdom of God as Jesus foretold it. Martin Luther was once asked what to do if he thought the end was coming tomorrow. And his advice was, plant a tree. In other words, invest hopefully in the future because it's coming. Have you ever prayed in times of uncertainty, in a time of waiting, maybe waiting for a child to be born, 
waiting to hear back from a college admissions office, waiting to hear back from a job interview, or maybe hearing from the doctor with lab results. I think when we wait, perhaps we can reflect on that beautiful poetic language that we heard this morning from Isaiah. And if you haven't recently reread Isaiah, remember that it comes in two parts. The first part up to about chapter 40, Isaiah is writing to the people of Israel before they are taken away to the Babylonian exile. And the end of the book of Isaiah might not have actually been written by Isaiah. Maybe his disciples, who knows? Bible scholars, this is what they do. They argue all along about who actually wrote the end of Isaiah. But that text is talking about the people of Israel after they get out of, after they get out of captivity. That's what we heard to, from today. After we're sprung, after we're free, God is talking to the people in Israel and saying, see, I'm about to create a new heaven and a new earth, and the former things won't be remembered or come to mind. So be glad and rejoice in what I'm creating. And what he is creating right now is the kingdom of God. And you and I are all in the mix. We're all called to be part of that revolution. So this week, as we go out into the world, let's reflect on the question, how do I live today when I'm not sure about tomorrow? We can draw our strength from God who invites us to participate in the revolution. And the great strength of God who will, who will endure long after cities and buildings and stones have been overturned. We can strive as we ponder this question to go out and help bring the kingdom of God a little bit closer as we love our neighbors, as we strive for a just society and a stable planet. We'll see that new heaven and that new earth come in to fruition. What we do when we don't know what tomorrow will bring is pray, pray without ceasing. This week, this hour, this day, God is asking us all to join the revolution. So as I said before, the question for today is, are you in? using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. We pray for Jeffrey, our bishop, our chapter, our dean, 
the trustees of the Cathedral Corporation, and all who exercise leadership in our parish and in the wider church. We pray for our covenant partner of the Diocese of Nuala in Tanzania, <clears throat> and the people and clergy of St. John in the wilderness, <clears throat> Elkhorn, grant, Almighty God, that all confess your name, may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all nations in the ways of justice and peace. We pray for all our elected leaders, especially the President of the United States. We pray for all who, through their vocation or ministry, place themselves in harm's way on our behalf. We pray that we all may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation. We remember especially the men and women that work the land which brings forth our food and those who labor whose labor provides the resources which make our lives possible. May we use our common resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours. We remember those celebrating birthdays this week. And we pray for all celebrating anniversaries, and especially for uh, Adam Lang and Mackenzie McCarthy, who were married yesterday. Grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, especially those on our parish prayer list, including Polly, Terry, Glenn, Steffi, Andrew, Maggie, Martha, Sonia, Pat, Judy, Isabel, Bob, and Carol. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died. We pray that your will for them may be fulfilled, and, that we, and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I give to you. My own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign now and forever. Amen. Amen. And let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in everlasting life. Amen. And God's peace be with you all. And also with you. Good morning. Please be seated. Um, check your bulletin for everything going on. I would just, if you didn't see the e-news on Friday, 
just getting the word out that um, we came to the conclusion early last week that we have a Christmas service at 4 o'clock and 8 o'clock. And St. Paul's has a Christmas service at 4 o'clock and 8 o'clock. And so as an experiment this year, we're going to combine and the cathedral and St. Paul's are going to offer Christmas services together. The 4 o'clock service will be at St. Paul's. The 8 o'clock service will be at the cathedral. There will be a full choir at both of these services. So, um, and then the next day is Sunday. Christmas Day is also a Sunday. And we will have our regular 8 o'clock and 10 o'clock services on Christmas Day. We are not merging with St. Paul's. <laughs> I want to put that right out there and be clear. What we are doing is figuring out ways to share our resources so that we can better be the agents of the gospel in our neighborhood and in our city. So um, put that on your calendar. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God.
Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of the universe and giver of life. You formed us in your own image and called us to dwell in your infinite love. You gave the world into our care that we might be your faithful stewards and show forth your bountiful grace. But we fail to honor your image in one another and in ourselves. We would not see your goodness in the world around us. And so we violated your creation, abused one another, and rejected your love. Yet you never ceased to care for us and prepared the way of salvation for all people. Through Abraham and Sarah, you called us into covenant with you. You delivered us from slavery, sustained us in the wilderness, and raised up prophets to renew your promise of salvation. Then, in the fullness of time, you sent your eternal word made mortal flesh in Jesus. Born into the human family and dwelling among us, he revealed your glory. Giving himself freely to death on the cross, he triumphed over evil, opening the way of freedom and life. And the night before he died for us, our Savior Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his friends and said, Take eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Remembering his death and resurrection, we now present to you from your creation this bread and this wine. By your Holy Spirit, may they be for us the body and blood of our Savior Jesus Christ. Grant that we who share these gifts may be filled with the Holy Spirit and live as Christ's body in the world. Bring us into the everlasting heritage of your daughters and sons, that with Mary, the mother of our Lord, and all your saints, past, present, and yet to come, we may praise your name forever.
and remember that Christ died for you. Be the moment of your heart by faith.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Go into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render unto no one evil for evil. Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor. And love yourself. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.